Hi, uh, I'm Bina Paul. We are here as part of the Dharamshala International Film Festival, uh, where we have just screened this amazing documentary called uh, Influence. Uh, and we have the filmmakers with us. We're happy to have the filmmakers with us because we have lots of questions. Uh, Richard and Diana, thank you for taking the time and being with us. And uh, the film has really blown my mind, I have to tell you. Uh, while we know uh, this world is all manipulated, etc., but the extent that we do see it in the film has uh, sort of been very, very, uh, in fact, very disturbing, I must say. I have to tell you that I was very, very disturbed after I saw the film. Um, before we go into that, can I just ask, because often when one sees films of this kind, of the, uh, um, the investigative kind where, um, you know, you're sort of unraveling layers as you've gone along, uh, how did it start? Where did you all start? And also a bit about uh, your uh, relationship as directors to the film and uh, how did you all work on that? Yeah. Sure, absolutely, Dina. So um, in 2017, uh, Richard was part of the Gupta Leaks team um, that was investigating this tranche of emails that, uh, that was handed to our editor at Daily Maverick, Franco Brickich. And I was part of the, I guess, the support team, you could say. Um, and so we were kind of watching this reporting unfold in real time um, at, a, at a time of real political crisis in South Africa, although I feel like it's been nonstop crisis around the world for, for many years now. Um, but, you know, there'd been this, this real sense of a malevolent force behind a lot of the communications between citizens in South Africa online, particularly for some time. And, uh, you know, that had, we'd also seen in the US elections um, and it wasn't clear until uh, the Gupta Leaks revealed Val Pottinger's role, why that was, where it was coming from, who, you know, whose hand was behind that. Um, and, you know, there were so many stories that came out of those leaks. Uh, I think, you know, we had a, a team of people who were, who were brought in from three different media houses uh, to look into them. As I said, Richard was, was one person. Um, and the Val Pottinger uh, story really just stood out to me in particular, just because, it, you know, I said to myself, well, if they've done this here, you know, there's been reporting of, of them being involved in other major world events, um, political events, surely, you know, the story must run pretty deep. And I think, uh, you know, I approached Richard and asked if he would work on the, the film with me. Um, and, you know, once we started to dig, even just a little bit under the surface, I think we very quickly realized the extent of the role that Bell Pottinger and uh, its co-founder, Lord Tim Bell, had been playing in global um, geopolitical affairs for many years, uh, starting, of course, with Margaret Thatcher, um, but indeed stretching out across the globe for, for the decades that the company existed. So um, we very quickly got stuck in and uh, I think started to unpack the various reporting that had been done, but, but going deeper as well. Um, and, and that's kind of how, how it started. Um, it's uh, interesting, Bina, no one, uh, no one, I don't, we've done hundreds, I think of, of interviews at this point and, and conversations. Uh, no one has asked us what our personal relationship to the film is. Yeah, yeah. I'd it's like a very, to hear very that. Interesting, yeah. It's a very interesting question because um, <clears throat> the leaks, um, as, as people who have seen the, 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 the film understand, the leaks effectively laid bare how a developing state like South Africa, uh, the government, or let's call it the ruling political party, effectively colludes with blue chip multinationals and rats and mice businessmen as well, in order to effectively um, leech off as much money from state co state issued contracts as, as possible. This is something uh, many Indians are likely familiar with, and, and the Guptas themselves were very familiar with this. So of course, this film has an Indian connection when it comes to the Guptas, uh, who came from uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh and were very quickly um, inveigled into the um, the, uh, the, the, the ruling system, the ruling, the ruling cabal. But I wanna say this, you know, it's an enormously personal film from the perspective of the fact that it still drives me insane that this kind of thing happens. Mm. Like, I, 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 I've been a journalist for over 15 years and I'm still as pissed off at this stuff as I, as I was uh, the first day on the job. And the same impulse drives me. Um, that drove me when, when I started. And I know the same applies to Diana. Mm -hmm. This is, the, these, this cabal, this collusive cabal, 
came very close to destroying South Africa. In fact, mm. you could argue mm. that the destruction continues long after all of these guys have left, mm. uh, got their, uh, you know, got new jobs, are, are getting their awards, are eating their business lunches, uh, and are on Zoom calls making lots and lots of money. Uh, we, we did a story today that the Guptas are in Dubai, um, living off South African taxpayers' money. They're 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 collaborating with another with another Indian with family another, as well. Indian, now. Indian family doing mm. doing the same kind of work. Uh, from the safety of Dubai, mm. um, which still won't sign an extradition treaty with South Africa. Um, this kind of thing drives us insane. Mm. And um, th that, that's what drove us to make this movie. Mm. It's that simple. Mm. Mm. So what was the bingo moment? Bell potting her, mm. Tim Bell. Mm -hmm. ha I mean, was there was it just one slow unraveling or uh, mm. did it uh, was it so obvious the point uh, why i'm saying this is that uh, when you see the film it's also connected and it just seems so um, you know obvious but was it like that for y'all was it the the process of the film did you get to meet tim bell so easily um, mm. And also, what did you think of him? I'm sorry, I'm packing in. It's a bit like your film, packed in with love. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we're Ding, used to it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah look, um, I think it was meeting I think, him. Uh, and, yeah. 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 Sorry. I think yeah, it was a okay. series of of discoveries. You know, I think we we had we went under no illusion that we were going to probably find a lot of information. Um, because it's you know it spanned it was a five six decade story um and you know w once we started to look and made a list of all the countries that they'd worked in it was it ran into the hundreds um but i think you know there were some real revelations along the way that 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 really were the those moments where you kind of like holy holy crap this is insane um and i think for me the, the biggest one was understanding the role that tim bell played in the south african election in 94 which of course big um, to be so proud of that was meant to be an example to the world of what was possible with reconciliation um, was a, a pre a pre-planned um, kind of organized event uh, with a lot of international advisors coming in from all, you know on both sides um, and there was a lot of interference and a lot of uh, a lot of paid consultancy going on um, to the extent that we that we now know from from many sources. I mean, I think we sourced this seven or eight times that while they, they, no one would go so far to say that the election was rigged, per se, that it was certainly mm. pre pre agreed between the different parties. Pre determined. Pre determined. Oh. Um, and so, you know, what we what we then came to understand was was Tim in his in his uh, malevolent wisdom understood that it, that even though he was working for the national party in in inveigling himself into the state uh, into the you know, the communication structures of the, you know, the, the whole system uh, and building those relationships, he then had access to the ears of some very important influential people, both on political, in the political spectrum, but also in the, in the burgeoning, in the, the, you know, the, the, the business in waiting portion of the country. Um, and then subsequently could draw deals um, off the back of that. And that became a model uh, for how to successfully, um, you know, game and election going forward in the developing world at a time where, um, when, uh, you know, I think the world was opening up after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, South Africa, as I said, was kind of the, 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 the big example. Um, and in, in many countries in Africa, they just kind of implemented the same model again and again. Uh, and while that doesn't sound like much of a revelation, I think it was just so, in, it was just to see it kind of laid bare in the research like that and to understand how neatly it all fit into this kind of arc of Bell's career um, and by extension the the communication industry you know from advertising selling products to selling political parties and political advising um, and then into reputation management it was kind of just this the, the next step in his uh, in his trajectory of becoming um, the, the spin doctor to to the stars mm. and to the you know some of the world's most notorious politicians and uh, and business people so I think for me that was that was a very big um, moment in, and you know it's very important for us to have that in the film although you know I think a lot of uh, it's, it's a very detailed kind of uh, stuff the South African constitution is complex as it always is um, but you know it's important particularly for American audiences to, to, to show 
you know how this process has has been entrenched in the, in the developing world and and you're seeing that repeated um, over and over mm. and what I, I mean I, I think one of the take-homes of the film certainly for us mm. um, is that this is how the 0.1 percent functions mm. um, when we were when we were doing our uh, like we're pitching around at hot dogs uh, in 2018 um, one of the, the major broadcasters asked us, is this a film about the deep state? Suggesting mm. that perhaps we we're gonna make a film that was effectively in its own right, the conspiracy theory. Mm. To which we answered, no, no, this is, this is how the world functions. Mm. There, there's nothing secretive about this. There's nothing illegal mm. about it. You know, that's, that's the funny, there was nothing illegal about how the Guptas retained, uh, exactly. retained mm. that um, they, they did everything they could to hide that fact, mm. but at the end of the day, that's not why they will go to jail. Um, mm. So, you, you know, when you look at a man like Tim Bell, who was the Forrest Gump of international geopolitics to, to a degree, he, he kind of stumbled his way into these massive, massive historical moments. Um, his deep um, and very real uh, platonic love affair with Margaret Thatcher allowed him an entryway into okay. the upper echelons of conservative power all over the world. Mm. You ask yourself, mm. um, how mm. did the Guptas end up employing Bell Pottinger? Well, for, 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 for one thing, they were the best. Bell Pottinger were the best at this time. Mm. Mm. Although they weren't this time out, ha ha. Mm. Um, but they were introduced to, uh, to, to Bell through uh, Chris Gagan, who was mm. on the board of BAE Systems, which is one of the biggest weapons makers in the world. And right. the, the person mm. who facilitated the meeting was a, a South African, a notorious South African gentleman called Fana Khlongwane, who is one of the best known weapons dealers in the world. Mm. There you go. There's no conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It's introductions, right? connections, networks. Introductions, yeah, networks. Yeah, you yeah. Know, meet this one, we're at a conference, you do this, you do this, you're Thatcher's boy. Fantastic. Yeah. That's how this stuff worked. Yeah. It's, a, it's a boys club, it's a gentleman's club. And uh, sadly, there are no gentlemen. In it. Yeah, you pay mm -hmm. to join. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in terms of meeting him and, and dealing with him, as you asked, um, we we had a sense that he would be someone who would be open to you know he, he liked the spotlight. He was very he was very plain about that, but we weren't sure. So uh, we dispatched Richard to London for a couple of days. He landed kind of bar hopped from club to club, all the places Tim used to hang out. Um, and eventually got a number for a person who knew him and, and landed up outside his front door, uh, went in and said, you know, this is what we'd like to do. We're doing it with or without your involvement. We feel that it would be better to have, to allow you to have your say. We want you, we want to hear what you have to say and explain yourself. We were very clear, I think, about uh, what our, our mandate was, what we were trying to achieve, that this was not going to be a hagiography. I, th I think he thought perhaps he could change mm, our minds. That's what I wanted, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course hmm. you do. Yeah. And you know, he, he was. We. It's good that I we mean, did our research. I mean, he was a seller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, and, that was what he was—a consummate salesman, right? Yeah. So you know, I think I, we were very. We we were obviously very. We needed to be very prepared because we we had we had a sense that he would try to spin us as he had spun everybody, uh, and indeed he did. He was a real uh, tactician. He liked to be able to uh, to test and see if you knew your stuff, and if if you did, then he would uh, grudgingly respect that. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting and illuminating couple of days. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, uh, in terms of all this archive footage and, you know, how do, uh, in the actual building of the film, apart from the ideas, uh, how did you all go about that? Did you have a lot of stuff? Did you have to work a lot at the edit? Um, just in terms of the actual filmmaking process, if you can, uh, yeah. Yeah, we were actually very organized going into this. Um, we'd, had to, we'd, we'd had about uh, well over a year actually to do some really, really deep research into the company. Um, we had had, uh, we'd built out some timelines of, uh, of Lord Bell's career. That was very helpful as well. So the film was actually relatively well structured on paper going into principal photography. Oh, really? um, it had to be, mm -hmm. yeah, it had to be Bina because if it wasn't, then uh, we could have gone to Malaysia. We could have gone to India. We could have mm, gone that's to- That's what I, I mean, wondered, At the yeah. end of the day, we mm -hmm. would have blown $25 million running all over the world. And uh, it just wasn't a sustainable way to go about this. So 
what, what we looked at was, first of all, stories that we were very interested in. Second of all, places where we felt our access could lead to breaking news. Okay. You know, for, uh, South Africa being the, the obvious one, London being another, um, Chile, Chile um, you know, Iraq, the, the Iraq of course, mm -hmm. you, you know. Um, so places where we felt we could uh, do some really, really deep investigative work, but also importantly, work our way, mm -hmm. um, which is with no compromises, uh, with no uh, editorial oversight, and with no, effectively with no, not holding back anything, mm -hmm. I, I guess is what I'm saying. So, mm -hmm. so that, that for us was very, very important. And that influenced the choices that we made uh, going into uh, how we set the shoot up at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, were, we were very fortunate to have a, you know, a, um, a budget that allowed for an archivist, a very experienced guy called uh, Ed, uh, what's his last name? Edmund, yeah. anyway, um, and he he was fantastic. He did a really good job. He, you know, they, they went through all of the traditional archives, but managed to find a huge archive of Saatchi and Saatchi ads, which you would have seen oh, throughout really? the film. Yeah. Yeah, which we felt, were, you know, kind of allowed us to have a bit of a tongue in cheek tone to the whole mm -hmm. thing because, yeah, you know, those absolutely. ads were, a bit, a bit psychotic, you know, if you, if you yeah. watch them in context. They, in the context, yeah. Things. Out of yeah. that context into this. Exactly, yeah. into this. They're one. insane out yeah. of context as yeah. well. Yeah, 70s, yeah. 80s, 90s ads. Too much cocaine clearly was uh, was imbibed yeah. <laughs> in the making of those commercials. But we felt that they they added a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek aspect to, to what we were trying mm -hmm. to say. Um, and so that was a massive, you know, it was a very valuable archive that, that Edmund found. Um, and our editor, Ryan Mullins, was just fantastic. Um, yeah, very, very strong. Very, very smart uh, and accomplished editor who was able to distill, you know, a lot of that, you know, a lot of information down uh, and find ways to bring an archive and, and make it compelling stuff that people hadn't necessarily seen before. So seen that, was before. A, that was a really fun process, yeah. Yeah, yeah because I think a lot of filmmaking... Sorry, I was just going to say a lot of filmmaking is also about looking at things again. You know, which is what Absolutely. your film does most. Uh, I mean, uh, just that. Um, uh, interestingly, I was asking some friends who are in the UK about whether they knew about this whole thing because I was so. And these are people who are very well informed, and mm -hmm. and they were nobody. I mean, I think nobody's really seen all this or known, mm -hmm. other than of course the fact that Tim Bell's and the whole scandal and Cambridge mm -hmm. Analytica and all that. But I think. To, to connect these dots in this way uh, was a really mind-blowing experience. What I mean, I think we're coming to an end of, to this conversation. I'd just like to, mm -hmm. you know, with the US elections coming up um, and this whole sense of this very scary um, world that we, we really don't know, how, how does one protect oneself? How, I mean, mm -hmm. how does one... Um, really um, know what communication should be trusted, what should be, I mean, other than perhaps your own personal integrity, but then, you know, there's also so much around you. So what has this sort of got you all to in terms of uh, uh, being able to take on the world today in a sense, in, or just living your lives in a sane way? <laughs> sure. Stay in I mean, bed. Uh, we get asked this question a lot. As <laughs> stay, you know, stay in as bed. <laughs> Yeah, well, staying in bed is very good. Yeah, it really is. Not very um, active. Yeah. One of the one of the truly terrifying things that we were told uh, over the course of this research by a, a deep Bell Pottinger insider was that um, the Bell Pottingers of this world are being effectively dinosaured, largely because um, institutions, companies, corporations, uh, uh, political parties, uh, politicians now insource their own misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, the greatest source of misinformation in the American elections in 2020 is not the Russians or the mm -hmm. Iranians or the North Koreans. So it's the president yeah. of, mm -hmm. of the United States of America who lies so constantly and so completely that um, he has uh, developed an entire um, truth campaign around him. Mm -hmm. He has unashamedly embraced um, perhaps the most bizarre conspiracy theorist group we've ever encountered, and that's QAnon, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So you're asking, you're asking a great question. 
But when the president of the most powerful country in the history of the world is basically a two-bit liar, mm-hmm. we've reached a point in our politics where the questions are, 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 are much larger mm-hmm. than they are about misinformation. Um, mm-hmm. From our analysis, we can say that the same tools are much less effective in, in the American 2020 elections than they were in 2016. All of those old tools, uh, to a large degree, have been um, have, 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 have been huh? kind of yeah, yeah, systematically mm-hmm. wiped out. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, really, really interesting stories about propagandists like the Lincoln Project. Um, for any of the people watching tonight, please look them up. They're mm-hmm. a Republican group that has gone out for Biden, and they're doing some very, very uh, effective strategic communications. Mm-hmm. Um, publicly they, funded. Well, not publicly, but they, they are for donations, mostly uh, privately yeah. funded, but they certainly get a lot of support from the, from the left. Um, uh, absolutely. So, so right now, the most effective messages mm-hmm. against Trump Republicans. Mm-hmm. We really are in an interesting new world, but I think the question is one that that, that should, we should never it should never relate to symptoms. What is mm-hmm. causing mm-hmm. all of this bullshit? Mm-hmm. And the truth comes down to being it comes down to the fact that our our democracies are so driven by money, so mm-hmm. unequal, mm-hmm. so fragile on account of that that. Even the craziest of theories can take root, mm. um, and mm. that's where we really have to. We, we've got to stop. We've got to stop concerning ourselves with the symptoms, and we have to stop concerning ourselves with the with the mm. hard work of reforming uh, systems that clearly no longer work. But I think you know one last thing just to say there um, to to end on a I suppose a positive note, which is. You know, inherent in what Richard was saying, you know, the fact that since 2016, there's been concerted efforts from various different um, parts of society to try to counteract uh, disinformation online, um, take stuff down, find groups who are who are um, disseminating this stuff. Um, but also in South Africa, as you would have seen in the film, um, the, the the action taken against Bell Pottinger, which was spontaneous. I mean, it was it was really it yeah. really was a, People a civic out, yeah. uprising. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you know, obviously also fueled by some serious frustration and dissatisfaction with our with uh, the regime before Ramaphosa, our current president. Um, but certainly, you know, th- that campaign, that fight back campaign was was fascinating to watch. It happened online. You know, Bell Pottinger as a PR company ran a PR campaign for themselves, which was disastrous. Within weeks, they had to shut down their accounts online. Then the next thing you knew, their clients were leaving them and before that you knew it, they were liquidated. And um, well, thrown out of the PRCA, um, you know, so that kind of action really does make a difference. Uh, and I think it's something that we've kind of held on to here, which is that, you know, sure, it was one company, but it was a very, very successful and powerful multinational that no longer exists mm. uh, as a result of civil society, um, you know, public action and, and investigative journalism. And I think what people can do is support investigative journalism, um, because those are individuals who are actively putting their lives on the line on a daily basis to make sure people understand uh, what mm. is being done in their, often in their name um, with tax with tax dollars, uh, and it's it's very very important that we that we you know uh, we have a very good friend Rana Ayub in India who you know who who suffers sorry what's the name all the time Rana Ayub um, oh. who wrote the Gujarat Files uh, you know these oh, are people okay, who yeah. who yeah. you know who who do a lot to try to to try to warn society of 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 the perils and what's going on. And those people deserve support, and um, and yeah, I think that for us is is I guess the most important message. Yeah, don't burn down your yeah. neighbor's house. Burn down the headquarters of a multinational. <laughs> <laughs> well, more power to the people is what yeah. we need to yeah. say yeah. as well. Exactly. That uh, exactly. people Absolutely. need to ask yeah. the questions and not. Uh, it's really interesting because uh, when uh, in the 70s, when this whole notion of the globalized world came up and uh, there was so much innocence about what this sense of globalization was. But now with, mm-hmm. you know, after I saw your film, I just thought, my God, we're all just connected through these mm-hmm. um, very, very um, m- mal-intended kind of 
corporations and uh, it, it was it was a scary experience thank you so much it was yeah. a lovely you. talking to you all and nice to uh, talk to you too. more more strength just to ask are you all on to something else or yeah. has something yeah. else uh, scented something also, else also a, also a globalization story interestingly enough yeah. uh, we're looking okay. into the um, into dark money um how dark money flows around the world so that'll be an investigative series that we'll uh, start on very soon well it's part of this story as well i think in, the, yes, in the influence yes. yeah it's about how yes, this yes, moves around yeah thank, thank you, you so much thank and you so i much. wish you all could have been you. here yeah, i think yeah, the covid has way. made your film yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank <laughs> you thank you so much thank you Bina. take care all thank the best so take care all the best